Sir Ron Carter was one of the founders of Australasia's most successful engineering firms and a man often called upon by the government to play a role in piloting big projects. He shares his insights. Life goes on, you don't necessarily sort of self-analyse uh, where you're at step by step. So, you know, all I can do is, is look back at, uh, at my career and wonder why it is that I was able to achieve so many of the things that I've done. And uh, if, if that is a reflection of my style, my answer is that I've always respected the knowledge of other people and I want to know what they think uh, in order to build my own knowledge up on any subject. And I'm, I've been a strong believer in the uh, amount of wisdom that exists in society in, in just very, um, you might say, very um, ordin ordinary people, people who themselves are, are not doing anything spectacular, but they will have, they will have some knowledge that's useful for society and I've, I've always tried to encourage people to, to, um, to tell me what they think. And that has led, I believe, to a respect that they have for me because they're in, they know that I'm interested in them and that's very encouraging to other people. So if they've chosen to follow things that I've suggested, then perhaps and to recognising me as a leader then it may well be because they feel I will um, pay attention to their views and to do my best to uh, accommodate them. So your single most important skill, communication, but also uh, a willingness to... It to almost might be as simple as friendship. I actually lo really like people. And um, I've found that as I uh, have shown my... Uh, interest and friendship to other people, they've reflected it back to me. So I like to number my friends in across the uh, across the community at, at any level of, uh, might say, uh, um, success. Um, and perhaps that's uh, that's a quality. I, I wouldn't like to think it's a unique quality. I'd like to think everybody felt like that, but. Uh, it seems to me that people quite like me, and I like them. Right, well that rather leads us into talking about motivation. And what personally drove you to success in business? I've always been very conscious that I've been working in a service industry. It's an industry that is built upon providing a service to other people that they've requested and that they have shown that they value our ability to deliver it. And once somebody shows that level of confidence in me, then I'm really determined to not let them down. So it would be too strong a word to say that fear has driven, fear of failure has driven me, but determination to make sure that I have got it right certainly has always been something I, I, I've, um, I've taken um, a lot of paid a lot of attention to. It's very, very important for me not to be wrong. <laughs> so would you describe yourself as a details orientated person? I describe myself as somebody who recognises the importance of detail. The scale of of uh, work that I've been involved in has meant that in most instances I, I haven't been able to deal with the detail myself, but I've been jolly sure that I'll get somebody who, who does get the detail right, because the devil is often in the detail, and particularly in, in engineering as, a, um, a, a, as a, a vocation, that um, you know many of the failures recognised in engineering have been been caused by a failure of some detail, and still the things that we need to um, we need to watch out for in delivering our service. But being a um, a service industry, I've always seen myself as trying to make other people's business succeed. So our job has been to fulfil a component 
of their needs, in other words, the development of some physical asset mostly. Sometimes it's policy, sometimes uh, it, it precedes the building of something physically, sometimes it concerns the operation of some engineering work, but always around uh, a physical entity. And, um, and so that, that's been the area of service that I have um, been active in. And so therefore, uh, I've had to be concerned that the detail was, was right as long as, as well as the big picture. At, at your level, how difficult is it to, because you've got the broad scope, how difficult is it to get down to that detail and what do you do, what are the techniques you use? Is it bringing in people you can trust? And bringing in people I, uh, that I would trust, but particularly recognising the type of skill that is needed. Um, you know, um, an organisation of, of, of this type, of the, the form that the Becker group has, it, and it's multidiscipline, no, no one person, certainly not me, but then again no one person within the organisation has, has the detailed skill necessary to, to deliver the service. So a lot of my effort was making sure that we brought into the firm, we hired and uh, people that had the skill level that was necessary. And I think our clients expected us to always have somebody who knew the detail of the task that they were asking us to do. Um, so we've we've developed through a process of delegated authority that um, a very flat business structure in which people have had a lot of opportunity to exercise their own knowledge but to do so within a framework of control that was set up by the company as a whole. Alright, and that again uh, nicely leads us into the next question. Again on motivation, but how do you get the best out of people? When you're running a, a very diverse uh, technological business such as this, um, you've got lots and lots of activities going on in all sorts of engineering disciplines and you have to have a, a, a reporting system uh, which is adequate to alert you to how well those particular p pieces of work are, are proceeding. How is the plate still spinning nicely or is it starting to wobble a little bit? So we instituted um, weekly meetings with all the key individuals in the firm who are given a very short period of time to express their, their, their views of how their area is going. And by that, you're really managing by a process of exception. So if somebody's got something that's troubling them, they're always encouraged to identify it and talk about it, not to, not to uh, conceal it from their colleagues, because um, we really have, have functioned along the um, no blame, no, you know, if you want to gain, you have to have no blame. You, you have to enable people to feel free to express the difficulties that they're having so that others can, can come around and, and help and support and get things back on track. Um, so again, it's that openness you've talked about yeah. from the personal one-on-one -on -one to a culture of openness. Yes, absolutely. I, I'm sure society as a whole needs transparency. And uh, so what I found that works well within our business, I found works well whenever I'm dealing with, with others outside the company in some of the other director, uh, director roles that I've fulfilled or working with SOEs or whatever, that, um, that the, the requirement is always the same. Let's know how things are going. We expect you to actually be on top of all the um, matters that have been delegated for, to you to run, but we also expect you to tell us when things are not going as well as you would like, and then give us the chance to bring the resources of the organisation in to support you. All right, all of which then again leads uh, nicely, it dovetails into the next question, mistakes, I've made a few. Um, because we've talked about an, uh, an openness culture where you can bring um, mistakes uh, to, to the table. What was your biggest mistake 
why and what did you learn from it? And indeed, is it good to fail sometimes because of what it teaches you? I think it's very good to be able to um, learn from failure. My career has been very incremental. So I've, I'm, I've been blessed by not having any really major events go wrong for me. I mean, a few times I've invested in some comp in shares in a company that have, have, uh, has not done well or, or has even lost, lost money, but I don't classify that as a, as, as a mistake. Within the business, uh, I, I think occasionally w one has relied on a person that hasn't delivered as well as one hoped. You've got to have the courage to then make a change in that direction. With a growing company like we've always been, this, the Becker business has grown at 12% per annum compound for 50 years. And I mean, that's a hell of a record. And so it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And with growth, you've got the opportunity to make changes. I mean, with very few exceptions, everybody that we've, been, that we've hired has been good at, at doing the thing we hired them to do. Occasionally we've asked people to do something that's got beyond their, their, their real um, best area of operation and we've always had the opportunity to say, OK, we, we, we won't ask you to do something that you're, that, that you're likely to fail at, we'll give you something that you're, you're even more likely to be a great success at. So we've been able to rejig the operation from time to time by putting people into the role that best suits them. Um, I, I really can, cannot say that I've ever um, been subjected to a major mistake, but I've certainly seen lots of things that haven't worked as well as I'd hoped and been able to do something about it. Because we've grown incrementally, even though Becca has always reached out to, we've been ambitious to do more than we had achieved to date, but always within the boundaries of our capability. Uh, we may not have had the opportunity to do something, but we had the skills to do it. So we've reached beyond our present work to um, to uh, 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 carry out tasks that were new to us and bigger than things we'd done before. But we always were able to build upon our on our uh, core strengths in doing that. And so we've learned in an incremental way. Um, we've never made a, a, a giant change of direction, say, well, we're... Let me give you an example. For a period of time, one or two of our very senior people wanted us to move into property development. We had all this knowledge of, of building things and of what they cost. So why wouldn't we be a great success as a property developer? But we, we weren't uh, of that frame of mind. It requires a certain different entrepreneurial skill, maybe in marketing, for example, which was, which is not something that engineers naturally educated to do. I mean, some engineers become very good at marketing. Our marketing was successful when we were concentrating on the things that we really knew how to do and that we had the experience behind us. And when the propositions were put to us that we should move into property development, we said, well, why should we? We're actually very good at at the job we're doing now, why don't we become even better at that job rather than try and take a step away from where we are today? Who knows how, how successful we'd have been if we'd have made a different choice. So lots of choices. Sometimes the choices may not have been optimum, but you'd never know whether they were or weren't if you never had the um, opportunity to pursue a different course. And we only, all I can tell you is the courses we did pursue have worked out very nicely. I want to ask you then about a life lessons. If there was one thing that you've learnt over your career which you'd never find in a management textbook, what is it? I think, I think the social aspects of, of one's life um, are not written in the management in the management books that I've read, and I don't profess to be a great reader of lots of management um, books, there's heaps of them, but I do think um, the 
the emphasis that we should put onto business uh, today and for the future is to a, a great sense of social responsibility. Um, I think to be successful over time, you have to have brought success to other people and yourself. And uh, if society has got a, a future, it's got to be one that embraces everybody, not just a few winners. Is that a different message to management books? Perhaps not. I'm not sure. that. Uh, but I've learned that not because I've read it in books, but because that's what I believe. And, and that probably goes back to my natural tendency to like and enjoy the company of other people, irrespective of how successful they've been in an economic sense or, or any other way. I mean, there's heaps of people that I know that have got values I greatly admire who and, and who haven't got an aspiration to become wealthy but who I, I envy aspects of their life and I think that's great to see um, and I think that therefore people feel feel that they should reciprocate, reciprocate that, that relationship so if you look at my close family friends um, they're people that I've known since, some since primary school days, some since secondary school and university days, and none of those associations have been built out of any sort of commercial relationship. I think it's hugely important to soak up information. Uh, whether one achieves that through reading about it or experiencing it um, is another question. Um, I, I find that um, with the huge variety of interests that I have, um, I don't have enough time to read a lot about any one of them. I, but I, I'm interested in them all. So a lot of my, my knowledge, uh, knowledge that I've acquired in part through reading, but I've added to in travel, for example, because this business has been involved in a large number of projects overseas, and many of which I had the opportunity to begin and, and get offices established elsewhere. I always have had found it very interesting to to meet and be with people of other cultures and other countries, and not just because of the project work we were on, but to understand something about the background of their culture, to uh, learn a bit about the way they they um, their life. Um, works um, to have some interest in their family and, um, and 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 get the opportunity to meet and talk to some of them outside the business direct business contact contact. Um, no, so my 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 interests are extremely broad, from social, cultural, um, and uh, and also business aspects. Uh, for example, I'm on. Um, th three art trusts, um, and I, you know, that I'm trustee for organisations that uh, purchase and acquire um, art to display to the public. It's got not, nothing much to do with engineering, but it's it's interested me to to learn learn about about art. Um, I had for some time in Southeast Asia a desire to collect Oriental ceramics. And I, I learned a, a, a fair amount about um, the way they were produced, how, uh, when, when they were produced. For example, what always stuck in my mind about um, some of the Chinese pottery, they were talking the, about how you, how you made the clay that was suitable to um, make a particular class of porcelain. And they called the material patunts. And you mixed various ingredients, and you you, you uh, then put them down in a pit for a hundred years until they were ready to use. And that always stuck in my mind as to how how far ahead people can think about about their own society. I mean, the people who did that 
must have been using material that had been put down by somebody a hundred years earlier than they. So their job was to create something for the next hundred years. Um, and I, you know, there's a lesson. There are lessons in life about uh, about duration. I think one of the the things that we 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 do badly in society these days is that we we find it difficult to make sacrifices in investment for things that we are not personally going to see the rewards for. And yet, society ha has to make decisions of that type, has to build a good, if you like, infrastructure, but also probably a good social structure that's going to stand the tests of time. That, that's probably not a very good answer to your question about how, how much reading do I do, but uh, I, what I do read is a very broad cross-section of material that I like to um, to uh, vary my, my reading amongst a whole range of topics.